Hello and welcome to the Cancer Education Series brought to you by Mercy One and the and Above and Beyond Cancer. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dick Deming, who's our founder, and he'll introduce our program tonight. Dr. Deming. Chris, thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for joining us. We got a really informative and um, I think entertaining uh, discussion uh, this evening. So our speaker is gonna be Lucas Nelson and uh, Lucas and I met several years ago. Lucas is the general manager for MedFarm and MedFarm is one of the companies that has been authorized by the state of Iowa to produce uh, medical marijuana, uh, CBD and THC and he'll explain that. Um, and the state of Iowa uh, has a program by which we as doctors can authorize cancer patients and other diseases as well, uh, patients to receive medical grade uh, marijuana products. And um, uh, it's really something that um, I'm coming to learn more about. Uh, there's a, a role for medical cannabis, both CBD and THC in helping cancer survivors with pain management, with uh, insomnia, with uh, appetite, with stress reduction, and a number of other conditions. And over the course of the last few years, as I've worked with Lucas and, and MedFarm, I've learned more about the value of the product and uh, the role that it has played in helping many of my patients both manage symptoms of cancer, but also help to manage side effects of cancer treatment. Uh, Lucas grew up in Indiana. He uh, got his undergrad degree at uh, James Madison University in Virginia and his law degree at Indiana University. And I said, as I said, he's the general manager of MedFarm here in Des Moines. Lucas, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Demon. Thanks, Chris, as well. And appreciate all of you uh, logging on. I am going to share my presentation here so you can see it. Get that up. I might have to ask Chris uh, to uh, allow me to share host's disabled screen sharing. There we go. Sorry about that. Hey, that's okay. All right, so should be able to see it now and we will jump in. So again, thanks everyone for, uh, for logging on and uh, I will be happy to answer any questions at the end uh, as we work through some of the uh, interesting parts of the program here in Iowa and teach you a little bit more about our medical cannabis program. So I'll start by just introducing a little bit about the MedFarm team. Uh, we are a local company located right here in Des Moines, Iowa, um, and, and staffed and owned entirely by Iowans. So what is it that we actually do? Um, with our licenses in Iowa, we are really responsible for every bit of the, the process here. Um, at our facility on the southeast side of Des Moines, we are responsible for growing all of our own plants. And then we take those plants and extract them for the oil that we make our final products from. We'll talk about all that in a moment. We're also responsible for all of the quality control um, internally. And then our products are also tested externally by the State Hygienic Lab up at the University of Iowa. As that process is happening, we formulate all of our, our products um, there in our laboratories and then we're responsible for packaging them and delivering them across the state to the various dispensaries. MedFarm also does own a dispensing license and with that license, we're actually responsible for, uh, for selling the medicine there to patients, working with them on a plan for what's gonna work, um, what doses to take, and again, we'll talk about all that as well. And of course, a large part uh, we feel our role in the state is bringing education and awareness about the program and so we're happy to be able to do that this evening. So I thought I'd start by sharing just a couple of photos from our facility, give everyone just a bit of an idea of what it looks like there. 
You can see on the left one of our small cuttings, um, and we use a process in our facility that really allows us to standardize all of the plants that we're growing. And that's important because we wanna make sure that they're producing all the same molecules over and over and over again, so that we can make sure we have the same formulations ready to go at all times. You can see there on the right, that's one of our vegetative grow rooms. In that room where we can control temperature, light, humidity, carbon dioxide levels, really all of those environmental factors, We'll grow our plants for several weeks. They'll go from the, the small little plants you see on the left to the bigger and bushier ones you see on the right. And that process really is there to put uh, biomass onto those plants. So we want them nice and bushy like you see on the right so that they'll be able to produce flowers. Give you an, uh, an idea of what the flower room looks like. You can see one of our flower rooms there on the right. You can see a flower uh, of one of our cannabis plants up close on the left. You can see right there on kind of those brownish looking parts and the parts that, uh, that aren't the leaves there, those are the buds or the flowers. And that's really where all of the cannabinoids, the CBD, THC, and those other molecules are stored. So it's really important that we're able to produce as many and as dense of flowers as possible throughout our entire flowering room. This entire process takes usually anywhere from 15 to 20 weeks, depending on uh, the particular plant that we're growing. So you can see here, this is one of our, uh, our THC flowering plants in this room. So from there, we'll dry our plants and we hang dry them all. You can see there a uh, photo on the left. They are cut at the base of the plant when it's time to harvest. And then we'll be uh, hung, hung to dry for um, up to about a week or so. On the right, you can see where some of our flowers have been trimmed away from the rest of the stalk and the stem and the things that we don't really need. And it's there that we'll actually grind up that material, put it into our extractors and start our extraction process. So on the left here, you can see uh, an image of some of our not quite yet refined oil. As we put our, um, our plants and those, those flowers into the extractors, they'll come out with everything that's in the plant. So of course, CBD and THC, those molecules that we want, but also some of the gums and fats and waxes that exist in the plant as well. And there we'll wanna make sure that we're cleaning those up and purifying them so that we're able to end up with just that THC oil, just that CBD oil that we can use to actually formulate all of our products. So you can see a, a shot of one of our chemists there formulating. Uh, those are, she's actually formulating some of our capsules. Um, all of our formulation is done on site by hand by our laboratory team. Thought we'd also show just a, a quick view of our dispensary too. We'll talk about that process a, a little bit later in the presentation, but again, just to kind of orient your mind around what our dispensaries look like. Uh, you can see a view of, this is actually our Sioux City, but mimicked pretty closely in Windsor Heights. Um, again, hopefully kind of a warm, inviting atmosphere um, for patients to come in. And, and again, we'll talk about that process in, a, in just a little bit. So we usually do get this question, always think it's worthwhile to answer, uh, but all sorts of security features that you'll notice in both the manufacturing facility and the dispensary. Um, we do limit access in the manufacturing facility, whether it's the dispensary or the manufacturing, you'll see cameras all throughout the building um, and everything in Iowa is also tracked by the state of Iowa. Um, the Department of Public Health administers this program and so they have a full electronic system that whether it's those really small plants we were talking about at the beginning of the process or a final product or anything in between, that they actually are responsible for tracking um, to just make sure that they know where everything is in time and know that, that we can uh, have eyes kind of on where those plants and, and the oil and those products are. Um, this is very, very common. Most states have some form of a seed to sale tracking system and then Iowa is no different. So we'll talk a little bit about the Iowa program first. Um, just give you an overview of what our program looks like. Back in uh, 2018, it officially launched and the law that started this program allows for up to two manufacturers and up to five dispensaries. We're obviously one of those manufacturers. Um, unfortunately, the second manufacturer in the state did shut down in June of this year. 
So currently the Department of Public Health is working on licensing another manufacturer. Um, I do expect that sometime in 21 that process uh, will be completed and we will have both of our manufacturers in operation um, and offering products throughout the state. Again, because it's the, the statute, there's only those two um, allowed unless that law changes. Then we also have up to five dispensaries that can be licensed across the state. Um, I mentioned ours, uh, our location in Windsor Heights, or sorry, in Sioux City that I showed some photos of. We've also got a location in Des Moines, um, in Windsor Heights. And for those of you that are, that are in Des Moines and familiar with it, that's right over by the, uh, the Sam's Club and the Walmart on University and 73rd. Um, both of our dispensaries, as, long, uh, as well as the other dispensary in Waterloo, are open to the public. Um, that one in Waterloo is owned by a separate company, although they do carry um, the MedFarm Iowa products. But um, right now, those are, those, those are the only three locations in the state. Back in March, uh, the other two operators did shut down their dispensary location, so we are down a couple. Again, the department is working, and, and hopefully in 21, we'll see some of those licensed as well. But um, like I mentioned with the manufacturers, until we have a change in the law, it will only be those five locations. And so of course that does present a lot of problems for our folks who live uh, uh, in rural communities or just don't live in Des Moines or Sioux City or Waterloo right now, and it does require some travel. Um, hopefully that's another thing that we'll be able to work on um, with our lawmakers and uh, potentially have some more access by, by the time all is said and done the next legislative session. So how do you actually get a, a medical card and get into this program? In order to be a, a patient, you do have to meet a certain couple of requirements. Um, you do have to have one or more of the approved conditions. We'll talk about those in a moment. A patient in Iowa can be of any age, but you do have to be a permanent resident of the state. And there is a fee associated with a card. It's either $100 or $25 if you qualify for reduced fee. Um, if you're on Medicaid or receiving um, supplemental Social Security benefits, those are some of the ways in which you can qualify for that $25 reduced card fee. And that is good for one year, um, that card. So it starts from the time that it's printed and sent to you. Um, and 360, 365 days after that, it does have to be renewed. Uh, that fee goes to the Department of Public Health, and it's really there to administer uh, the program. We also have a primary caregiver aspect of this program. And what a primary caregiver is, is someone who can buy or um, administer products on a patient's behalf. So again, a couple of requirements. You do have to be a resident of Iowa or any of our bordering states. You do have an age requirement here. You do have to be over 18. Um, and it may be, as I've got listed here, a parent, a guardian, um, but could be really anyone. We, we most often see a parent, um, you know, maybe for a minor child or uh, a caregiver for uh, potentially someone who maybe isn't as mobile, but those are the types of situations that we see most of our caregivers falling into. There is, again, another $25 fee for the, uh, for the caregiver license as well, but with that license in hand, um, a caregiver is able to go to a dispensary, purchase product, be in possession of it, and then um, help administer that product to a patient. So I mentioned that you do have to have one or more of those approved conditions. I've got them all listed right here. Um, I'll just highlight these couple at the top. Uh, chronic pain is where we do see the most, uh, the, the largest majority of our patients. Obviously chronic pain can be brought on from all sorts of different situations. We see everything from really some people qualified from some of the other conditions that you see listed here. We see uh, fibromyalgia. Um, we see people who have just simply had sort of the aches and pains of life, others who may have suffered some sort of workplace accident or, or something like that. It, it really does run the gamut. Um, and again, if it's a situation that's contributing to causing you chronic pain, then you would qualify. Um, PTSD is a newer condition. Of course, seizure conditions, those are some, that's one of the conditions that really got this whole program started. Um, and then cancer is one that we we treat quite often as well. Um, so the, the second most populous condition there in the state for the registered patients is cancer um, right now. But you can see the, 
the list of a variety of other, um, uh, you know, pretty serious conditions that people may be suffering from that do qualify for becoming a patient. So if you're a patient uh, or if you qualify as a patient and you have one of those conditions, how do you actually go about getting your card? The first step is to go to your provider um, and have your condition certified. There's a form that you can print off. Um, you can access it through our website, through the Department of Public Health. Some providers also have some around uh, their offices uh, every once in a while, we'll hear that. But that form is pretty easy to, to understand. It really requires the provider to fill out some identifying information and then identify the one or more condition that you may have. And really that's sort of a double check for the state to say, okay, the person here that is trying to apply has been checked out by the doctor um, or by another healthcare provider, and they've said, yes, this person does have one or more of those conditions. With that form in hand, you can apply then, um, and you apply either online or you can still mail in a paper version as well. What it'll ask for um, in that application is really just, again, some identifying information now from yourself, obviously giving that proof that you are an Iowan. Um, the department it does receive all that information, but they're not looking at say the merits or anything like that. They're really leaving that up to the, the um, provider there who certified you. So as long as everything's filled out correctly um, and the fees are paid, then you can become a patient. Um, and what happens after that is that the department um, actually will mail a card. They'll email a version of it and then mail a physical card to your mailing address. Uh, but as soon as you get that email, you're eligible to come in and, and buy in a dispensary. And then of course, once you get that card, that's what you'll be presenting. But um, it's really gotten streamlined. It's really a, a lot more efficient than it was when this program first started um, and really is a, a lot simpler to navigate than it used to be. So that's certainly a good step and a step in the right direction. Um, and of course that can all be accessed from our website, from the Department of Public Health website, even if you just type in medical cannabis uh, right into Google, you'll be able to find it. So I did mention um, that it's a certification. It isn't a prescription. We get all sorts of questions about that. Um, this is just really a, a, a way for us to make sure and the state to make sure that um, we're not running afoul of federal law. This is what you'll see in most states across the country is that this is a certification process as opposed to a prescription. Um, and, and I did include a list of providers who are eligible to certify. Iowa licensed uh, MDs and DOs uh, are, have always been eligible to, but just recently, um, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, podiatrists, all those folks can also certify conditions. So depending on who you may receive your care from, uh, you might find that any of those folks would be able to actually certify for you. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be your um, provider for which you are being treated. So if you um, are suffering from cancer and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be your oncologist, it can be another one of your providers who may know and be familiar with the fact that you do indeed have, um, have cancer or you know, we're at ALS or MS or any of those other things. It doesn't necessarily have to be that person that you may be seeking treatment from for that particular condition. Um, I always think it's interesting to highlight some of the new things that happened in, in July uh, when a new law went into effect that did really significantly alter some of the, the aspects of our program. Um, nurse practitioners and PAs and podiatrists, like I mentioned, those are all eligible to certify and I did, uh, I think I pointed it out, but PTSD is a relatively new condition uh, that has been added. Chronic pain is our pain condition that I, I noted. It actually had a, a bit of a definition update and change. Um, and I think it really works a lot more straightforward. It's a lot easier to understand what chronic pain is versus this old untreatable pain that we used to have. Um, I mentioned that the department sends your card to you now. That's because the, the change in law has actually eliminated the need for the Department of Transportation in the process. So um, for those of you who know anyone or who may have experienced a program at any point in its early stages, you used to have to go to the DOT. And I'm sure you are like most others in, in Iowa that maybe don't enjoy that as much uh, as, uh, as, you, as you otherwise could. So we've got that out of the way. That's not a step that has to happen anymore. 
no one has to go to the DOT and have a card printed there. It just simply arrives in your mailbox, um, you know, a couple days after you complete that application process. We do have another new aspect of our law that does require a pharmacy uh, tech or a pharmacist to be employed by each dispensary. And, and that's something that we have in, in each of our dispensaries as well. Um, perhaps the most important change that did happen is that um, previously in our state, we had a 3% cap on THC, and that was really at the manufacturing level. So it's significantly limited types of products that any manufacturer could make. And the law has changed now to remove that 3% THC uh, manufacturing cap, and it replaced it with a purchase limit. And that's much more common to what we see in a lot of other medical states or even some recreational states, of course, too. Um, but what that says is, we don't care what the products are as a state. What we're going to look at is how much THC someone is buying. And so the, the law right now allows for up to four and a half grams of THC over any 90 day period. Um, and so that's kind of a rolling process. So, um, you know, were you to buy a, a, a gram today, for instance, in 90 days, that gram is going to come off your limit. Um, a little bit less than we see in some other states uh, as far as that gram cap goes. However, the state did put a waiver process in place for increasing that, uh, that purchase cap. What that allows right here, you can see just a screen clip of, uh, of some of that form, but it allows a, a patient to actually um, work with their provider to have that cap increase. Um, and so we've seen a number of these, especially from pain, uh, terminally ill patients, um, some of our cancer patients as well, because what we know is that that four and a half grams, that really what that divides out to is about 50 milligrams a day. That's more than enough for some patients, um, but it's certainly not sufficient for all patients. And so you can go submit this form again to the Department of Public Health. And uh, as long as it's been signed by your provider, they'll set a new cap. And it doesn't mean that you would buy up to that cap or have to or anything like that, but it does allow a patient who has one of those waivers in force um, to buy beyond that four and a half limit. So, we see caps um, you know, usually in the 15 to 25 gram range, but it really does just depend on who the patient is and what the condition they might be dealing with and then what that treatment has been like. Um, so that can happen really uh, basically right after you enter the program, right away as you are entering for terminally ill patients, but then for all others um, after you've participated in the program. So just to give you a couple stats on what Iowa's program looks like right now, we do have uh, a little over 4,500 active card holders, and that's of uh, October where we have our latest numbers. About 16% of uh, our patients do have caregivers. So I mentioned that a little bit earlier, and we do have a, a decent number of folks who have taken advantage of that. Um, and about 41% of the patients in our program do qualify for that reduced card fee. Um, so, so, you know, obviously, we're a little bit smaller than uh, many other medical programs out there, but that being said, we, we've certainly ticked up um, over the, the course of the couple of years that the program has been in place, and I do expect that that will continue to grow as we develop more and more access uh, for patients across the state. We do have over uh, 1,100 providers who have participated in the program. When I say participate, I mean that they've signed at least one application. Uh, the Department of Public Health has put in a process where by you can actually call the Department of Public Health if you're having trouble finding someone. We get this question a lot, hey, I'm, I'm interested in participating, or I want to talk to someone about it, but I'm having trouble locating uh, a doctor or my, you know, my nurse practitioner won't, won't sign for me. You can call the Department of Public Health. They maintain a list of doctors or other providers who have opted in to making their name uh, be shared with patients who may be experiencing that trouble. So you call, you'll identify the region of the state you live in, and then uh, the Department of Public Health will actually provide you a list of some doctors or other providers who are eligible to certify who may be, uh, you know, who'd be willing to talk with you about, um, about potentially getting enrolled in the program. So I found that as we've shared that information with patients, they've had good success in finding someone that way. Obviously, there's other um, portals to sort of locate that information. 
of course, you know, Facebook groups and, and, and other groups that, um, you know, you may be a part of that, uh, that are there for people together uh, that are dealing with some of these conditions. Those often can be really good sources of information for where you might be able to find some providers that be willing to talk about potentially getting you certified into the program. Um, just thought this is this is always interesting. People ask and wonder about what a kind of typical patient looks like. Um, so again, this is this is program wide across Iowa. Our average patient is about 57 years old, and it does tend to be just a, a bit more female, but pretty much right down the line, male and female. Uh, and we've actually treated patients as young as two and as old as 102. So uh, the medicine really does have application to a variety of different conditions, um, age ranges, all sorts of situations. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're well equipped to be able to handle just about any of those situations that may pop up. I did mention that our, uh, our, our number one condition here in the state is pain. This is pretty common in medical programs across the country. It's often one of the, the conditions that is treated most, uh, but you can see cancer uh, and MS and seizures there as some of the other um, folks that we've treated a lot. So you're a patient, you are headed to the dispensary, what types might you find there? Um, worth pointing out that uh, we do get this question some and it can be a bit confusing given the name of our program. I'll always refer to it as our medical cannabis program, but uh, but the technical name of, of the program in Iowa is the medical cannabidiol, medical CBD program. However, our program does allow for full range of CBD and THC products. And like I noted, uh, the purchase limit only applies to THC, but both of those molecules, as well as others from the plant, are eligible to be put into products and, and are indeed in our products. In Iowa, we are permitted to manufacture and patients are permitted to buy uh, oral forms, topical forms, nebulized suppositories and vaporization. Uh, the state does not allow edibles and it does not allow smoking. Um, so you might be wondering what's the difference between an edible and an oral form. Really the big distinction is on sort of that, uh, those extra elements that you might find in an edible form. So, you're not gonna find chocolates, um, you're not going to find sort of flavored gummies or things like that that you might have known about from like a recreational state, for instance, but um, you will find tablets, for instance, in, um, in our dispensary as an oral form. Um, smoking is again, specifically prohibited under the statute, um, not something that I probably see changing anytime soon in Iowa, but we again do have vaporization, which allows for an inhaler form that's done at a much lower temperature than smoking. So uh, in our, I'll talk about um, our product because right now those are the ones that are on the market with that other manufacturer having shut down. Um, we've really designed our products around ratios of cannabinoids. So CBD to THC. You'll always see our first number being CBD and our second number being THC. Um, we start there on our calm line is our, uh, our, our more CBD forward moving down the line to our more THC forward. And this is not definitive by any means, but I've put a couple of the different conditions or the different symptoms of conditions that we'll treat um, with those different formulations. So you can see the CBD is, is often gonna be good for reducing anxiety, reducing inflammation, reducing seizures. Uh, those are some of its, its best characteristics, whereas THC is really going to be that pain reliever. And so you'll see that if you're dealing with spasticity or certain types of inflammation, um, that's really where you're gonna see a lot of benefit from the, the heavier CBD formulations. Um, MS, some of our mixed pains and some of our other symptoms that maybe you're dealing with all sorts of different things. That's where a lot of our patients find success with that balanced mixture of CBD and THC. Um, and then as we move down into the uh, comfort formulation, which is our more THC forward, that's where you're really dealing with, with heavy bouts of, uh, of pain. Maybe that's throughout your entire body, as opposed to just localized in one specific area. Um, we also see the, the comfort, the THC forward products being really good for uh, nighttime use because it can help patients stay asleep. Um, and as I'm sure you know, conditions or not, we all know that what it's like to, to have a rough night of sleep can really affect you for days on end. So um, a lot of our patients that do have those issues 
with sleep, we'll, uh, we'll find that those THC forward formulations help in the evening. So what's it like as we, um, as you walk into that dispensary? Starts just by noting um, some of our, our um, patient consultants there and what that, what that interaction is like. When you walk in, you'll be speaking with one of our, our patient consultants. We hire folks that have backgrounds in uh, nursing, um, we've got some that have dealt with substance abuse. We've got a farm tech that I mentioned. Um, and it's really with that combination of people that we bring together uh, a plan for you as you're, as you're considering what products to purchase, um, what doses are going to be right for you, and really try, based on our scientific backgrounds, um, whether that's from research studies that have been conducted around the U.S., um, clinical work that has been conducted outside of the U.S., uh, and we really try to bring all of that together to make those right recommendations. Um, with uh, the, your first visit, you'd be filling out a patient intake form. It gives us some information about what is it that you're dealing with? What have you, you know, sort of tried before as far as treatment regimens go? Where have you had success? Where have you not? Do you have any experience with, you know, other cannabis forms at any point in your life? Uh, and what types of things should we, we be on the lookout for? so that we make sure that we're dealing with any potential side effects. Um, really wanna work through that in a sort of consultation process that first time to make sure that we're able to help recommend the right product and the right dose for each patient. Um, that process can take anywhere from you know, 10 to 15 minutes up to an hour for some people. It just really depends on what your situation is, uh, what you're facing, and what might be right for you. Um, and worth noting, obviously, the situation that we're in right now is that although this is often uh, in the past has been a face-to-face -face interaction, we're able to do this by phone. And in fact, that's what we're doing right now in our dispensary. So I'm still able to have that interaction and really work through that, that intake form for each patient uh, to make sure that we, again, set you on the right path. So then what happens? Um, our patient consultants will make a recommendation on product. I should note that the, the program does allow a patient to make his or her ultimate choice on what products to buy. However, we really try to walk sort of step by step with you through that process so that you know what products um, might work and then what doses might work for you as well. Um, send everyone home with a dosing schedule. You can see an example of our comfort, um, again, that THC forward dosing schedule here. We also have a custom one, and we're able to really dial that in based on our experience for you know the your your age and your sort of situation based on the condition or the symptoms you're trying to treat, um, and of course make ourselves available obviously after the fact for hey this doesn't seem to be working do I need to increase my dose a little bit? Um, what we find, which is a little different than than opioids and a, a number of other um, pain relieving you know types of treatment, is that once people find their dose, they really do sort of stay at that dose for long periods of time. Um, obviously, with some other forms of, of treatment, you've got to sort of be increasing that over the course of time. And that's really not been the experience that, uh, that our patients have had. Um, we also make sure that you're clear on side effects. I'll say that, you know, we do have a, a small percentage, you know, three, four, five percent of our patients um, that do experience some side effects, things like uh, dry mouth, fatigue. Um, we do get a little bit of dizziness or some of the, the brain fog that um, people have probably heard about associated with THC. Of course, in this program, that's a, that is indeed a side effect and something we're trying to deal with. Um, and, and we can do that in, in a number of different ways. Obviously, we can adjust the dosing uh, for you, but uh, we can also add back in some more CBD that can really help balance uh, the, some of those side effects that someone might be facing. So obviously, we want to alert you ahead of time. Each person does respond a little bit differently. Like with, with most treatments and medicines, there's certainly not a one size fits all with this. And so that's really how we can end up with some patients finding success at, at very low doses and others needing those higher doses. Uh, but, but again, trying to work through that with each patient so that you know you feel armed with all the info that you might need. Um, and, and just as a, a note, we do try to do all sorts of, uh, of surveys and check-ins and and follow-ups to really make sure that, that we're dialed into what's working for you, what isn't working for you, how can we get it adjusted so that it does, is it a new product, is it a new um, dose, is it uh, you know, taking something up or down, and of course offer patient journaling too. Um, 
where someone can sort of journal along with what they're, they've been taking, whether or not that's worked, um, and then bring that back in and, and really work with our consultants to, um, uh, to hopefully find a, a really docent product that'll work for you. Um, so that gives you a little bit of idea. How have we, how have we done? Um, we did run a survey there at the beginning of 2020, um, and we had uh, just about 80% of our patients had reported uh, an improvement in their quality of life. Um, we've all had about 60% of our uh, patients who've been able to reduce some of their medications, and of course, 62% uh, of that reduction were opioids. And, and you see this really in research and literature across the country. You see this in Iowa and in other states is that one of those things that people have been able to reduce by using medical cannabis is uh, some of those opioids. And, and we're all aware of, of how harmful and problematic those can be for some people. So it is a nice option for a lot of patients. Um, you know, I'll say that it, it certainly won't work for every single situation. Um, it's obviously not going to cure any of the conditions that, that are approved in this state. But what we hope and what we found really, again, across the country that medical can cannabis can be is a tool in the tool chest to help you deal with some of those symptoms, deal with, with the things that a, a particular condition may bring on. Um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and maybe take some questions. I do have our website um, and our social media accounts are all up there. Of course, we're, we're always looking for, uh, to, for more engagement with people who are curious about the program, have questions, had success, haven't had success, uh, and, and want to always do everything we can to make it better. Um, so with that, um, we can see what type of, uh, of questions we may have. Sure. If you have a question, you can use the question and answer at the bottom or the chat, and I will gladly relay that to Lucas. And uh, I appreciate your information. It's uh, it's astounding to me how many people take are, are using uh, the, the the products. You know, you mentioned forty five hundred card holders um, and eleven hundred providers. Do you see how how rapidly has that number increased over the time, and where do you see that going in the future? Yeah, you know, it, it uh, the we've actually been one of the states that has grown the quickest with a number of providers. Um, I think that's probably a testament to the medical community across the state has has engaged with it, has tried to learn, has tried to become at least aware. Um, obviously, we haven't hit everyone, but but I think that's been um, one of the big successes of the program. I am continually seeing in the numbers that the Department of Public Health produces that we have new um, doctors, new DOs and MDs, we have new um, nurse practitioners and PAs and, and podiatrists that are being added each month uh, as far as new people who have certified. So um, I know a lot of patients do run into that issue and you know, kind of their first attempt, but um, with a little bit of, uh, of work, we usually can find, uh, you know, at least an ear for someone to talk about it to see if it's right for that particular person. Um, you know, as far as patients go, we are on the smaller side for, uh, uh, you know, for a program that's been around for two years. That being said, um, especially as, as we've sort of gotten at least a, a handle on our understanding of how the virus works, we've really seen those numbers tick back up. You know, in the beginning of the pandemic, it had really fallen off. I think a lot of people were having trouble either not wanting or not being able to go have their card renewed or, or go visit their doctor in the first place. But um, we've seen that that's leveled off and, uh, and, and in fact has started increasing lately. So know that telehealth um, is something I probably should have pointed out. Telehealth is a perfectly acceptable way for you to meet with your provider. It, it's allowed by the, the state of Iowa. Um, and so if that's a relationship that you have or can take advantage of with your particular provider, provider can certify you through that type of an interaction too. It doesn't necessarily have to be in person. And obviously in our, in our day and age now, that is a, uh, a good option for a lot of people. Right. Uh, we did have a question pop up. Lucas. Drug, drug testing, when you're looking for a job, will it be positive? Yeah, so um, each one of our products, even our CBD forward, um, does have at least trace elements of THC in it. Uh, we do that because we truly believe in the science behind those two molecules, their interaction together, even in those trace uh, amounts for our CBD forward, 
we really have seen the evidence that that does help amplify the effects of that CBD, for instance. So that's why those are in there. However, it will cause a, a potential positive test. Um, what we often recommend is, is making sure that you understand, and of course, they're happy to work through you with you if we need to, but understand that that is a, a risk and whether or not that's something that might, um, you know, hinder your ability to get in. Uh, unfortunately for, you know, some of our um, uh, folks that are holding you know, commercial driver's license, for instance, that can be a hindrance. Um, I hope that as we keep moving forward, we'll see some scenario where we can address that. But right here in Iowa today, uh, you know, the, those, some of those protections, unfortunately, just aren't in place. So uh, that is a, it's a good question. And it's a good thing to point out that there is that risk that um, if you're consuming any of these products, you, you might um, show a positive on the test. Do you find, Lucas, Lucas is, oh, go ahead, Dr. Deming. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, Lucas, I'm interested in where you think we're going with uh, research. Obviously, in the United States, research had been limited because of federal laws. And um, I know that those are being um, looked at and the FDA is approving some uh, protocols that would uh, look at some clinical trials. So what do you know about uh, the opportunity for clinical trials in the United States with CBD and THC? And then uh, another question kind of related to this, as, as you mentioned, the CBD, the THC isn't going to cure the conditions that uh, it's approved for, and patients are going to be taking other medications along with CBD and THC. Um, has there been much um, research on how to integrate CBD and THC into regimens that might be using conventional prescription nausea medicines or pain medicines? Sure, yeah, those are two great questions. Um, so let's start with research. Um, as a broad overview, uh, there have been some, um, some uh, approved by the FDA here in this country, some, um, I'll say, cannabis-derived or cannabis-influenced. Um, we do, there's a, 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 a THC synthetic drug that's been approved since the late 80s um, here in the United States. And in 2018, the FDA approved the first uh, plant-derived CBD drug, um, which is called Epidiolex, or people pronounce it some other ways, but um, that really was for a couple of very rare, but very serious seizure conditions. Um, now, around the world, again, that research has been uh, much faster paced than here in the US. However, as you indicate, um, there does seem to be a, uh, uh, an eye towards some loosening and some allowance for more clinical type trials to be conducted. Many of the states that have uh, medical programs have been doing various types of observational research, which, which certainly isn't clinical, but um, I suppose is something. Here in Iowa, we do uh, actually have a new provision in our law that provides for that. And we'll see if the Department of Public Health, obviously they're, they're tied up with some other things right now, but. Um, but I imagine that hopefully in the next year or so, we're seeing a, a, an observational type study being conducted by them as well. Um, there are some trials that have started. Um, a doctor out in, I believe, Arizona is where she's based her study, is conducting one of the first clinical trials um, with some, I believe, PTSD patients. And the DEA is also reviewing a number of applications for um, cultivators to actually be able to grow cannabis specifically for those clinical trials. So not only does that indicate we've taken a step forward from, from that side, but that there's clearly interest in having some of these clinicals conducted. Um, I'd love for that to be able to happen here in Iowa. I think you know one of the things that a company like ours that's, that, that uh, is based in science that tries to follow the science as close as we can, we've gotta be on the front line sort of pushing for that. Um, and I think what most people will find is that, you know, we're not surprisingly, we're going to be able to expand and grow programs like ours and others quicker with some of that research base. So, um, you know, depending on the, the type of research, it certainly is more and more happening every day. Um, just, geez, I think today or yesterday, the UN 
um, has labeled cannabis as a, uh, a, a less, I forget the exact word, but less dangerous, I think, um, drug. And for, so that's a big movement. Um, that's one of the, the major moves we've seen from a world organization that might put some pressure here on the U.S. to sort of get its act in order and at least realize that, it, that it's, uh, it's due time to conduct some more research. We're seeing that done in Canada. Um, and so we're really, you know, the U.S. will fall behind if we don't, uh, if we don't sort of get in the game soon. Um, to your other question, Dr. Deming, about sort of interactions and things, um, we do, based on a lot of that research and based on um, those FDA-approved varieties, we can derive a lot of information from. We put all of that to use right here in our dispensaries. Um, what we see the most, um, just a couple common things, you know, uh, warfarin is a, a drug that seems to interact with all sorts of things, and, and that can usually be a red flag. Um, a lot of folks that may be suffering from or dealing with any sort of, uh, of mental illness or sort of mental health conditions, we are awfully careful when it comes to monitoring those interactions. Some can be completely fine, but we, we do have evidence, um, you know, from, from other clinicals that there can be some interactions there. I'd say the, the biggest thing that we know is that um, these molecules are usually processed through the liver. Um, and this is especially true of CBD, is that we really want to be monitoring um, those folks who might be taking drugs that, uh, that could cause liver concerns. And so when we see that situation, we'll often be asking that patient for more information. Some patients are uh, certainly willing to have us speak with their providers and kind of have that sort of three-way conversation there. Um, the nice part about uh, these molecules and the, this medicine is that for the most part, even in, it, we can really start at those very small, slow doses um, and understand what's gonna happen before we say have to, to ramp up for any reason um, and put anyone at, at more risk. And so, um, you know, we, we've seen those couple interactions where we haven't recommended someone take a particular molecule or, really make sure we're limiting that top line dose that you might be taking over a given period of time. But um, for the most part, with what we know, both from those, those clinical trials um, and, and really the research around the world and then our own sort of, you know, more anecdotal, but, but our knowledge over the last two years um, is that we can usually do a pretty good job of managing those situations where we might have interactions. Great, thanks. Lucas, do you see patients that might be with you for a while and then uh, sort of discontinue use because it worked for them and it, they got what they needed? Maybe it's anti-nausea uh, situations for a cancer survivor and, and they, or do you see people sort of connect with you and then stay with your, with your company? You know, it really does depend on the person and their condition. Uh, of course, you know, our, our patient consultants love seeing people over. Uh, and, and again, I think have really developed some close relationships with a lot of our patients. But um, when, we, when we see them depart for good because, uh, you know, they've maybe been able to, to, uh, to overcome whatever they're facing, of course, that's, that's a great situation for us too. Um, you know, a lot of our patients that have some more of those conditions that you're sort of with for life, um, MS, being one of the ones that, that we'll treat pretty often. And, you know, people go in, in waves, just like it is with anything from, you know, uh, common cold to, to some of those more serious conditions is that you can have those bad days, you can have good days, um, and we'll see some people on a very routine basis. They're in every two weeks, or they're in every week, or they're in every two months. Um, and others will see for a short period of time and then won't see them for six months again. Um, the, the advantage and disadvantage, I guess, uh, you know, is that we do really want to try to make sure we're, we're locking in a, a dose that works for you, um, which can take, you know, a couple of days or, or a couple of, uh, of, of different attempts at finding that dose and what product works. But um, at the same time, if it's a, something that you only need kind of as needed or, or on your worst days or when... Um, you know, you're, you're fresh off of, of some sort of treatment or something like that, then we can really dial in a plan that works for those situations too, um, which is ultimately, I think, a, a good thing about medical cannabis in general and about the way hopefully we've designed some of our products here is that 
if you need them when you need them, that's perfectly fine. And if you need them on that regular basis, we can make that work as well. We have another and question. Uh, third party quality control. Are there reports available to the public? Do you have reports that uh, for what uh, Turpins uh, your products include? Are your products full spectrum? What kind of soil nutrients do you use to grow the, the, in your growing process? Any pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, or other chemicals used to, to grow harvest dry or, uh, or create your process? Um, what sure. are your prod, uh, product standards? How are your product, deter, product standards determined? Sure. Um, I'm going to pop up. It looks like you were reading that one right here out of the chat. Yeah. So I'll make sure I'll Perfect. get everything here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so third, third party quality control. So uh, that, like I mentioned, is all done at the state hygienic lab. Um, that is the lab that is required to do it under law. Uh, there aren't other right now in Iowa, probably because of our small size, there aren't other commercial labs. So it's all done up at that state hygienic lab. Um, and there's a full, gosh, it's 20 some odd page document that actually um, dictates what we have to, to have tested and what the laboratory has to do. Um, and there's obviously that, that hard line between what happens is that we send our products and um, actually our oil as well that before we even formulate, those things get tested. And then once they're approved, we're either allowed to formulate with the oil or allowed to actually stock the shelves in any dispensary with those products. Um, they're tested for pesticides, heavy metals, microbiological microbiolo impurities, um, and then uh, potency as well, so that you know you're getting what is actually what we say you're getting when you look at a label. Um, the, uh, the other aspect there um, is that uh, it really is kind of on every single formulation has to go through it. Every different type of oil has to go through it. Every batch does get tested. And so, um, you know, I feel quite confident, not only with our internal testing, but with that external testing that, uh, that certainly everything has been well examined before it, it gets on those shelves. Um, we do have um, um, certificates of analysis that are produced by the laboratory. They do not quantify terpenes in those tests. However, we do um, quantify those in our laboratory at our facility. Now, with most of our products, um, our tinctures, our tablets, uh, our cream, you won't see really any of those terpenes listed because most of them are stripped away through that purification process. However, um, our vape products, we do have some that are more purified and then some that are sort of less purified and have those terpenes available. Um, and in those products, you will see the one that has those terpenes, uh, the top five that are listed. And those are really the ones that are most predominant. The others are in trace form. So depending on your situation and depending on your preference, because of course, terpene, um, those compounds in the plant that give it taste and smell that you know, you'd find in all sorts of botanicals, it does affect the experience a little bit. Not every patient wants that experience. So for some, we'll have that more um, distilled and, uh, uh, and purified form available that basically has no taste. And then those ones with the terpenes do have some taste. Um, and so lemonine, I know, is one. Uh, pinene is another that shows up in a lot of our um, products that, again, are, are really in those vapes right now. Um, Soil and nutrients. So we've got a, uh, an in-house nutrient mix that we use. We use just cocoa um, otherwise for our soil. So a very, very uh, clean process. We don't use any sort of chemical pesticide or fungicide or anything like that. Again, we have to have it all tested for that anyway. Um, but we've designed our facility, um, and it's not shown in some of those photos I had, but designed our facility in a way that really, really does limit contaminants, um, whether that's by showering and scrubbing in before you enter a grow room, um, our limited access. For instance, I don't walk into any of our grow rooms. You got to have specific shoes on that don't leave our facility. We really do all we can to cut down on any sort of risk. Um, one of the things we do use is beneficial insects. It's kind of a newer thing in, uh, 
um, in cultivation and in, in really farming operations in general. But that gives us a nice way to uh, be able to use sort of, I guess you'd almost say natural um, control if we would ever experience any sort of problem. So um, really think it's important that we don't use those types of chemicals because obviously people in our program are dealing with some, some pretty nasty situations often um, and the plants do tend to accumulate whatever's in the soil. So it's very important that you understand as a cultivator, whatever you're putting in that soil is gonna end up in the plant. And so we're very, very uh, precise about what we do there. Um, and then how are our product standards determined? You know. It's a couple of different things. I, I mentioned that do document that the Department of Public Health produces. Those really set the limits for, say, how much of a solvent could be in there or how much uh, of a pesticide could be in there. And of course, those are quite minuscule amounts. Those are for more or less kind of the same throughout the industry across the, the country, which I think is a good thing. Obviously, we're sort of trying to always follow those best practices. Um, but then we are able to determine too sort of what we want from that potency level, what we want from those ratios. And again, what we base those on are uh, those back to the same clinical trials, those observational research studies. The reason we picked that 20 to 1 is because we know that that's a good uh, balance of CBD to THC, especially if we're trying to treat something like a seizure disorder. Whereas we know that that 20 per, um, parts THC and one part CBD can be a, a very good dose of pain relieving THC, but still got a little bit of that CBD to help activate those molecules, um, but also block some of those side effects as well. So um, not to say that, that we've got everything 100% perfect, right? We're always trying to learn and stay up on research to figure out what those new product formulations that might work would be. Um, and I think, you know, here in 21 and beyond, see us start to add to that mix um, as more and more research is done and as we learn more, you know, from our patients as well. Hopefully that answers just about everything there. Good question. Lucas, that's, I, I, I really appreciate your answers and it really um, uh, proves the point that you guys are, are so professional in what you're doing. And um, I hope that gives everyone confidence really a, uh, a science and it's science-based and it is, uh, you can be uh, sure of the products that you're getting at the med farm dispensaries. Um, so thank you for being so thorough. I had the opportunity to, to take a tour of the uh, facility as well. And, you know, it, it reminded me of many of my chemistry labs. Um, uh, and all of the science that is happening there. And it certainly gives me a reassurance as a physician who certifies patients to be eligible to get these medical products that uh, they're really in good hands with MedFarm. Yeah, so well, well, thank you for the, the kind words. And you're exactly right. I mean, we do, we take uh, the scientific aspect very seriously. We're trying to do things a little bit different than even in the medical uh, side of this industry that, that maybe hasn't allowed science to guide it. So yeah, when you, uh, when you walk through our facility, you see laboratories, you see our PhD chemists and our, our other chemists and lab coats and you know, full PPE and goggles and hair nets and you know, our cultivators have all been formally trained and then uh, have, you know, through university and then have been trained in other grows. And so we really do try to apply science to every bit of our entire operation because uh, I think ultimately that results in the best outcome for, for a patient and hopefully the best uh, experience with us in general. Well, Lucas, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, we, we've chatted, I'm looking forward to the time when in Iowa we can actually conduct some clinical trials and look Indeed. at how uh, CBD and THC can help improve quality of life and help um, advance research in this area. We're so fortunate to have you here in Iowa and thanks for sharing your expertise and knowledge with everyone here tonight. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for having me and, uh, and thanks for joining and for the questions. And of course, like I said, if there's uh, any other questions you have, we've got a, an email account. You can reach us through all those social media through our website. So never hesitate to reach out. We're, uh, we're all here and, and hoping to, to do everything we can to uh, yeah. answer questions and make it better. Great. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, Thank Lucas. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris. And uh, I'm going to sign off and say goodnight to everybody. Thanks for attending. Thank you.
Good night, everybody.